Hey everyone and welcome back to the live stream. Uh, it is back to school time, at least for most of us. Some of you are probably already back in school. Some of us are getting ready to go back to school or getting ready to send our kiddos back to school. But that doesn't mean it's just for kids. I know that during this time, I have a lot of people that are looking into changing careers. They want to get into medical billing and coding, or they've just got that back to school vibe coming in at them and they're looking for CEUs or maybe an extra credential. So we're going to talk a lot about certification prep, about continuing ed, about how you know if a certification is right for you, what are the good certifications to get, 2024 exam changes and more. So grab yourself a drink, say hi to your friends in the chat, and let's get ready for today's live stream. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Contempo Coding live stream. If you are watching this on the replay, hit me up with a hashtag replay and let me know what was your big takeaway from this video. So if you're new here, I am Victoria. I am here not as much every Friday over the summer because I have been uh, vacationing a lot. I have been to HealthCon. I mean, basically this mother went from HealthCon to Disney and then took a, a final finale trip with my daughter up to the American Dream Mall in New Jersey so we could go to the DreamWorks water park and go to the uh, Nickelodeon Universe indoor theme park for a little bit. And I'm actually getting to the point where I'm like excited to just stay where I'm at and not travel for a little while and get to work. Um, I know I was talking about the the back to school vibe and I'm feeling that I'm getting ready and I I don't know what you guys are ready to learn but I am still behind on my plans to learn PCS coding but are you guys feeling the back to school vibe are you feeling like hey I want to uh, I want to I want to get a new certification I want to get into school um I personally like I'm I'm want to do some studying but I'm like so feeling the grind right now I've just been traveling for I feel like the, the past month and uh, looking forward to getting some more study materials. I've got a whole bunch of podcasts that I'm like so excited to put out. Uh, half of September's videos are like already done in the works. And uh, I'm, I'm hoping to now have some more time to put together to get on some webinars um, and get some, some more materials, get some more uh, maybe even workshops, virtual ones put together. So if you have suggestions, definitely let me know. Uh, John, are you getting ready for the CDEO? That's I heard that's a, a, a pretty good one. I'm curious to see how the CDEO will compare to the new micro-credential that Ahima is working on for outpatient auditing, because I know that's one of their, one of their micro-credentials they just put out. John's also been a big promoter of me getting out this sock puppet video. So in my, I've had this idea for a while that um, I'd love to teach E&M in a, in a more fun way, I guess, to almost like a, 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 the way you would teach a child. And I've always said, like, I want to use sock puppets. So I posted it out to LinkedIn just to see kind of what kind of feedback I get, because I have this theory that in healthcare, because we're so burned out, especially, that our brains are just not wanting to sit for the long, formal, traditional, boring types of education that we've had in the past, and that people are like very open arms to just dumb this down to me like I'm watching it on Bluey. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool? Uh, to make a video where where I would just like use sock puppets and teach e &M coding and all the burnt out providers that are so tired of it can just watch the kitty video where I teach e &M with with sock puppets. Um, so there's a LinkedIn post that I post that said if this post gets a thousand likes that I know people are interested in this, like I will legit teach e &M with sock puppets. And originally I was thinking like, oh, I'll have to get down and like do the, you know, but I think it would be more fun if I did it almost like if you are old enough to remember like lamb chops, what was it called? Play around, playground. 
lamb chops, whatever it was with Sherry. And she used to do the little lamb. Oh my God. Could you imagine that? But like with E&M coding, like I have a little doctor puppet and I, I just think it would be fun. I think people would learn better with that format because they would be more engaged and it would be more memorable and fun versus if I was trying to just sit and bore the hell out of them for four hours with systemic illness and two chronic conditions and blah, blah, blah. You know, I feel like that would be like so much like people love Bluey right now, right? Like that is a big, like an adult fans of Bluey because they're like, oh, this is healing my generational trauma. Like, I feel like if we just made, <laughs> if we made kid content for medical coding, it would go so well. And by the time, if we if we used it on actual kids, by the time they graduate high school, they might actually have the years of experience that employers are looking for in the medical coding field, right? Everyone wants, what, two, three, four years experience? Oh my gosh. Anyway, so what is what is it up to? I, the, the, the post is currently up to 484 likes. So we're almost halfway there. It has to hit a thousand before I will commit to making Victoria's coding corral or whatever we'll call it, where I where I teach E and M with soccer. Hey Sarah, glad that you are stooning by. I know Sarah's a busy busy person these days. My God, you know what? That is interesting. Um, they did the yeah they used to have uh, the E and M examples in the CPT book in the back. The um, the kind of samples of, oh, these are these are similar cases of like, here's what would fit a 99213, here's what a 99222 kind of looks at. Like clinically, this is is similar and uh, the clinical vignettes and they, yeah, they took those out and I, I haven't seen them come back. I'll be interested if we see anything back for um, 2024. Do I have any refresher courses? I have two refresher courses available right now. Uh, CPC and CRC, and they're more so for certification prep. That is on my docket. It's so hard though right now because I have so many cool ideas that I'm like, oh yeah, I should be doing refresher classes. I should be doing new courses. I should be doing webinars. I should be doing more videos. I should be doing TikToks. And it's like, it's trying to dive through and figure out what everyone needs. But if you're someone who is, um, is has not been doing medical coding in a while and you're like I think I need a refresher what I would suggest is you can get do I have them here you can get the step-by-step -step medical coding books I think I have them in my bookshelf actually and the cool thing about this is I noticed when I purchased the bookshelf versions on vital source of the um step-by-step -step books they include a course so that is like if you need a refresher that might not be a bad thing to to check into let's see what i could do here where is my books i have so i'm trying i'm trying my best to get into the um virtual virtual swing of things so here uh yeah so if you buy the bucks 2023 step-by-step -step medical coding book if with the ebook it comes with like a course and you just like, there's a button and you click just launch course and it comes up and has all of the course material. So that's a good way if you're looking for a refresher or you're looking for something like super duper budget friendly. Um, if you're looking for something that's a little bit more um, support, I'm, you can go to medicalcodingmasterclass.com. That's the career masterclass that I put together. Hashtag sponsored. I do receive commission for the signups for this program. Um, but if you're looking for an online medical billing and coding school at your own pace, uh, this is the one that I endorse fully because they take such good care of my viewers. Like they give them uh, some of them to get free laptops. They're basically Google Chromebooks that you can do your coursework with. They include eBooks because that's the way we're going with the industry. That's what employers are looking for. And they include an externship, which you don't find a lot of places and a college certificate of completion when you're done, which is super, super cool. Yeah, the Buck step-by-step -step books I used to teach um, at Burke's Technical Institute some years ago. And those were the step-by-step -step books. That, uh, the step-by-step -step books were the ones that I used way back when we were in ICD-9. Uh, and I've loved them ever since. I think that uh, the format's great. The materials they provide to instructors is great. It's, it's 
I think they they have some better practice questions too that I really like. And the cool thing too, so I've been promoting the step-by-step -step books for a while. Um, and I was getting so many complaints from people though, because they would only give you the odd number answers to the questions, like the practical questions and the test yourself questions. And I'm like, look, you're not going to find better like study books, but yeah, they're only going to give you half of the questions. Well, I guess so many people were self-studying using these books that this year they finally were like, Hey, you know what? We'll just give you all of the answers because we recognize that, you know, giving you half of this working anymore. Hey, Diana Davis, thank you for becoming a channel member. Appreciate you and your support. If anyone has any questions, by the way, that they want me to get like direct attention to, Super Chat is the priority way to get your questions addressed. Um, yeah, so if you're looking, if you're looking to get into medical billing and coding, this is the program that I recommend. You can go to here I am. Uh, medicalcodingmasterclass.com. And it's very affordable. It's a lot more affordable than the other programs that are out there. And basically, the, it's like the career masterclass is free to sign up, but it tells you like everything you need to know about medical billing and coding. And then like why Preppy kind of is the best program that's going to check all those boxes. Yeah, medicalcodingmasterclass.com. Awesome, awesome, awesome stuff. So on second attempt, I did not clear the exam. Can I enroll again this year? The AAPC does not have a period where you have to wait until you can test again. Basically, as long as you have paid your fee, you can test again. Um, you have to still maintain your AAPC membership and pay the exam fee. One of the things about the exam fees are, you know, they have the one attempt and they have the two attempt. If you are like, I think I'm going to pass this on the first, I'm only going to buy the one. Cool. Awesome. Um, but if you don't pass and you want that second attempt, you can't like upgrade to the two attempt. You have to pay that one exam fee all over again. Uh, and same thing if you buy the two attempts and then you pass on the first attempt, you don't get like a partial refund of it. Uh, so there's there's no kind of like mix and match policy there. Excuse me one second. I picked up, I think like the tiniest hint of a head cold when I was in Orlando the other week. So I've been having like this tiny little bit of congestion and a tiny little bit of a cough, but nothing like serious, thankfully. Chantel has a great question here. My question is, what to study for the test of coding and billing specialist, and is every test the same? So when we're talking about um, billing and coding, so I'm, I'm not sure if you're talking about the CBCS or the CPC. I don't have a lot of familiarity with the CBCS because it's not one that I've sought out. I have nothing against that certification. It's just I don't think a lot of employers are looking for it. Like there's pockets of regions where they'll accept it, but not broadly. Um, as far as that certification, I'm not too familiar. I can speak to like the CPC and the CPB for those exams. And you can verify this. I just did a podcast interview with Ray Jimenez, who is the VP of marketing, uh, not marketing, um, product services at the AAPC. And she's had a lot of experience working with their exams. And what she said in the interview is basically they have a huge exam bank for the online exams and you get totally randomized, you know, for the CPC, it's a hundred questions, totally randomized hundred questions. They make sure that they're all, you know, of the appropriate mix of levels and difficulty so that you can complete them within that, that four hours. Um, the paper exams, which we'll still be using through the end of 2024, there's different versions. There's like an A1, B2, you know, type of version. So there's different versions. So they're all not same. So effectively, like you can't really like, cheat on the exam if you get a copy of it because there's different versions. Thank you, Daphne, for becoming a channel member. Appreciate you and your support of the channel. This is an awesome question. So I took the the Ahima micro credential certification. I think it is a good. It, I think it's very comparable to the CRC exam. 
I think the only difference that I noticed with the micro credential, um, which I may have to next year, you know, at the end of this year when I update my CRC stuff, include it, is there's some different terminology, like different provider type of terminology that they use. And I've even seen this with like nurses studying for the NCLEX that they'll they'll try to twist things a little bit by using different terminology for a provider type or a facility type. Like they ask a lot of questions about um, um, different different facility types and, and provider types, but they don't use like some of the more common terminology just to kind of make sure that you're really in depth in there. But yeah, my reviews will prepare you for the micro credentials that the via HEMA has via HEMA. <laughs> Will I be doing any case examples? I have, I think, um, do I have a case example playlist? Let me see if I do. Cause I know I have reviews. One of the things I wanna work on next is doing previews, like doing like, hey, before you start this chapter, here's the things you need to focus on. Um, and I feel like I might have a case example playlist. So let's take a look. If we go to the main channel page, there we are live, 70 people watching. Um, and that's just on YouTube. I think it's 79 total right now. Uh, playlists. So I have a lot of different playlists for some of the common things that I hear about, like EM training, uh, chapter reviews. Ooh. Oh gosh, hold on one second. <laughs> you don't need to see my personal playlists. Uh, da, 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 let's go. I don't know. Can I share an incognito mode? Let's see. Case studies. Oh, yes. Hold on one second. There is, if you go on the main channel, playlist of case studies that I did. So we've got here fracture repair, case scenarios, ENM, outpatient. Some of these are probably old ENM outpatient. Uh, vats, blepharoplasties, hernia repairs. So yeah, there's a whole playlist that I have together of the different case examples that I have. Very fun. Ganesha asks, do I have to remember the ICD-10-CM guidelines? Here's the cool thing about medical coding. Cool thing about medical coding is there's a lot of information. So you don't really have to memorize any of it. Uh, people ask me all the time, they're like, hey, do I have to memorize all the, the ICD-10 and CPT codes? Like, that would be horrible. I don't know that we'd find many people <laughs> that would want to work this job if they had to memorize literally tens of thousands of codes. Um, there's probably not a lot of people that would, would have the capacity to do that. So with medical coding, it's not about knowing the answers. It's about knowing where to find the answers. So you don't have to know off the top of your head the guidelines for sepsis or HIV. As long as you, once you come across those, know that there is a guideline and where to find those guidelines. So I would say don't memorize the ICD-10-CM guidelines, but do familiarize yourself with them. Do try to remember what is generally in them. So when you see something and you're like, oh, you know what? I know there's a guideline about something with OB sequencing and I'm brain dead night today and I can't remember what the heck it is that you can go back and review it and go, oh yeah, you know, the OB codes take priority over codes from other chapters. So as you work more with them, you'll start to memorize those types of guidelines. But running straight out of the gate, you do, you do not need to memorize all the ICD-10-CM guidelines. You just need to be familiar with them. Yeah, so the uh, I wish the CPC online study guide exams were for the full length of 100 questions. I just want to make sure I can stay within the time frame. So there's a way to break them down. Um, so if you can do 25 questions in an hour, that means you can do it in the time frame. 50 questions in two hours because the full exam is 100 questions and it's four hours long, right? So if we break that down in half, 50 of those questions you should be able to do in two hours. We break it down into quarters, 25 questions in an hour. So you really don't need to uh, do a, sit down and do a whole four hours, 100 questions. You can, or you can also purchase um, multiple practice exams. I know the AAPC 
with their practice exams, they have, um, I think they sell them in blocks of 25 or 50, so you can buy multiple. Um, there's also some available in your study materials. So let me take a look. I think the study guide, for example. Hey, Bertram. Yeah, thanks for thanks for the congrats on my YouTube button. Isn't it pretty? <laughs> um, so let's take a look over here. So like I have again, I'm trying to get familiar with the ebooks. So I'm purchasing my stuff in Vital Source. I don't know if the AAPC is still having the special, but they did have one where you could get the paper books and the ebooks um, pre-ordered for 2024. And like they would include them like the paper books and then you would get basically the ebooks for free. But if we look at the study guide, they do have, let's see here, chapter 20, test your knowledge. So there's study material here, like in the study guides if you, and, and the study materials, if you have them, that you can go through these as well. And then, of course, if there's additional practice six materials that you want, you can click that link right there and they'll hop you over to the online practice exams you can purchase and you can buy like a whole bundle of them. Let's see, each of them have 50 questions. OK, so since each of them are 50 questions, you might as well just buy like the whole bundle, bundle uh, ABC and they have bundle DEF. And if you buy the bundle, you know, uh, if you do A and B, that would be 100 questions, right? Yeah, I think I think the practice exams are great. They really do help prepare you too if you're going to take the online proctored exam, because it helps familiarize you with using the online options and you know clicking the A, B, C, and D. So if you guys haven't heard yet, uh, there's been a lot of I think inaccurate information being distributed about what's happening with exams in 2024. Um, a lot of people are saying there's going to be no more in-person exams, which isn't quite right. There are still going to be in-person exams. There's just not going to be paper exams. There was a very robust uh, discussion that happened on AAPC's social hour that uh, Ray Jimenez and AAPC Alex discussed about what's coming up with this, the exams in 2024. So uh, a lot of people attended that. That was great information. If you are on Facebook, and I know not everyone likes to be on Facebook anymore these days, but if you're on Facebook and you follow the AAPC, either their group or their, you can just follow their Facebook page. They have social hours there every week where they bring someone in and they talk about what's going on. Um, so in 2024, they are moving to exam centers. So the exams themselves, your options are going to be either you take it you know, in your home or a conference space that you have private and can set up to the standards of the exam, meaning that, you know, you have nothing on your desk but your books and a drink, uh, you aren't going to be disturbed, there's um, no background noises, that kind of thing, you have an external camera, Let's see if I have my... Sometimes I keep an external camera around on a stick. I don't have it with me today. But you have to have an external camera. So all of these different set of requirements and someone's gonna watch you through a camera, take the exam the whole time. They're gonna watch your uh, share of your screen to make sure that you're not Googling answers or asking ChatGPT or anything like that. So that's option one. Option two, starting in 2024, is that you take them at a majeure location. So there, there's lots of different locations. I know some people are probably going to be upset because they're like, I'm going to have to drive two hours. Um, and, uh, you know, is there going to be a perfect answer for everyone? No. Um, but, you know, we, we have to do the best we can to, to work within the confines of what we have, right? And I think it's on par with what a lot of other standardized exams are doing. You don't really see out there that other associations are having groups of volunteers uh, proctoring very prestigious certification exams, right? So I, th I think we're getting more on par with what industry standards are. So let's see if I can find, so I can bring up for you guys. They do have them listed online. Let's bring it up. 
Yeah. So if you go to the Majeure website and you can just, it's M-E-A-Z-U-R-E, -E, Majeure, you can just Google it, Majeure uh, test sites, and it'll show all the different locations. Like for me, I'm here in Pennsylvania and it'll show. We have one in Allentown, Ambler, Bloomsburg, Clarks, Leola, New, Newtown, Boyle City, Philly, Pittsburgh, and Washington. There's not going to be one, it looks like, in Reading, Pennsylvania. So the people that are in Reading will probably have to go out to Allentown. Uh, it looks like Lancaster, which was another common area. They don't have one for that. But again, you still have the option to do online remote proctored. Um, and you can look for areas like if you don't have a private area at home, you can try the library. You can try looking to book a conference room. You could tr maybe try a cheap motel room. Uh, you could see if there are businesses that rent out conference areas for cheap. Sometimes they'll do it by the hour. So you can just book like a, a block. I would, you know, say since the exam is four hours, maybe block out five hours just for setup and so forth. Are all of the exams the same? No, the exams are all different, especially now that we're moving towards the the online exams, they're all going to be randomized. So it's going to be a giant pool of possibly thousands of questions, and they will take a certain level of, you know, uh, easy, intermediate, and hard questions and filter them to you in a, in a randomized amount. How do you become a brand ambassador? Like for me, I don't do brand ambassadors. Um, yeah, that's not that's not one of the, the services I offer right now. Um, I'm not sure I would need that. I'm not sure what, what a benefit of that would be mine. But if you're looking to be a brand ambassador of other organizations, I'm trying to think who does affiliates right now. Find a code does. Um, I think some of the resume services do. I know I've had a bunch of people reaching out to me about their AI stuff lately. It's like the gold rush right now with who's trying to, to develop the best AI coding tools. What is a SME? SME is a subject matter expert. So in medical coding, we typically have them based off of specialties. So uh, you might see someone who's an SME in urology coding. That means they have expert knowledge. They have years of experience and can speak at a very high level to that specific subject. We often specialize in medical coding, just like they do in other healthcare fields. You know, you have uh, people who have broad general knowledge, but usually we we specialize just like nurses do, just like physicians do. We work in pediatrics, or maybe we can do pediatrics and you know hematology, oncology, because we cross trained. But you can do a lot um, when you become a master level in one subject. Growth in medical coding. Yeah, there's lots of growth in medical coding. You can go from coder to auditor. You can become an educator. You can work uh, in different software firms. You can work in, in legal fields. You can do consulting. Uh, I've known some people that just work in specialties now in Epic, that they work in, in building certain sections of Epic, you know, medical records or, or um, edits and, and, you know, order all kinds of stuff that Epic does, the, the medical record system. Can I talk about the CRC and any study tips and how to get more familiar with HCC overall? I would say... Um, get some study materials. If you are looking for supplemental material, this is the first edition. They have a second edition. I think Sherry is trying to work on a third edition with the V28. We'll talk about that in a second. But Risk Adjustment Documentation and Coding, this is a fantastic book. Uh, read it cover to cover. I love it. If you can just find a list of the HCC, start just looking over it a few times and really going familiar and going, oh yeah, there's an HCC category for cancer and for sepsis and for, you know, all the different uh, subjects. But this, I think, is a great one. Um, I'm trying to think. I have a CRC review class that is phenomenal. 
Um, but on the subject of risk adjustment documentation and coding, so I saw online the other day, people were asking if uh, Sherry was going to be releasing a third edition of it because they're making the you know, B28, which is the newer version of the HCCs for Medicare. And uh, the feedback that I had heard was that this book, if you'll notice, is published by the AMA. The AMA owns CPT. So apparently they don't have a lot of interest in continuing to do this book since it has uh, mostly ICD-10-CM content because their book of business is CPT. And I thought that was particularly telling that they're not interested in producing things that have to do with risk adjustment and ICD-10 and anything that might uh, interfere with fee-for-service and CPT. I am set to take the CPC exam. I feel okay, but what would you would recommend that I study review? Um, go through your study materials and see where you didn't score well. If you have areas where you scored maybe under 75%, certain sections, E&M is a tricky one for people, cardiovascular. Um, if you have uh, interest in doing a review class, you can check your local chapters. A lot of them are doing review classes now. I have a, a review class at contempocoding.com that's on demand. You can also look into getting the practice exams through the AAPC that we talked about. They have different bundles and they are very excellent at preparing you for the actual exam. Do you see medical coding stepping away from remote positions? I really don't. Um, there's been some information that's been published in Healthcare Business Monthly where uh, they have assessed how many of us are working remotely and how many are kind of in a hybrid situation versus working fully on site. And we've seen the trend kind of continue that more people are working remote. Um, we're starting to see a little bit more hybrid. Um, but I don't, I don't see it going too much back into the office because traditionally we've, we've not been a high volume of in-office people. Medical coding has, has been uh, one of the prominent work from home jobs pre-pandemic. Bridget has a coding question and this one I can, I can speak to. Not always can I speak to them because when people are like, what's the code for ball? I like off the top. I, I know y'all think I'm like brilliant, but I don't have the code books memorized. But in any case, this one I want to speak to. Um, pediatric coding, is it appropriate to charge a wellness in addition to an E&M with the same visit? So this is a modifier 25 scenario. So in order to bill a wellness visit and an office visit, a sick visit on the same day, we would have to bill with modifier 25. That means it has to be significant. It has to be separately identifiable. What does significant mean? Well, that's kind of gray. Um, when we talk about pediatrics, I think about like if a patient's coming in uh, or if someone's bringing their, their pediatric patient, their baby, for example, and they have diaper rash, like what baby doesn't at some point get a little bit of diaper rash, right? Is that significant? Is that something that we did a, a well enough work that we like, oh yeah, this is definitely worth an extra 99213? Um, one thing I, I want to will caution about with peds, because I think some people get confused about if a patient's coming in, they're pediatric, it's time for all their vaccinations. You don't get to bill a 99211 worse uh, nurse visit just for the fun of it. Like that's not the, the, the fee for the nurse visit. If the nurse is giving all the injections is within the actual injections. There's no separate 99211 that should be billed. And actually you can't bill, I think, a 99211 with a lot of procedures and a modifier 25. I think they made CCI edits now saying you shouldn't be doing that. Um, but yeah, so keep in mind that significant, that separately identifiable. And I know a lot of practices, they like to see the providers actually write two notes so that it's like, here's our well visit and here's the separate sick visit. Um, and one of the things I like to suggest is, you know, it should have been something that they would have come and, and sought treatment for anyway. Like if it happens to be a runny nose or something that they would have been like, hey, I need a refill and have submitted that through the patient portal. Is that really significant? Is that really separately identifiable? Would they have sought medical care if they hadn't just incidentally been there for their well visit? 
So can they do it? Uh, yes, but there is some caution and definitely the documentation that needs to support what was separate from that well visit that needs to be built out. What did I just see up here? Inpatient DRG is hiring in bulk today. Why? I don't know. Maybe a whole bunch of inpatient DRG coders retired. They hold on to those jobs forever and ever and ever. I'm telling you. Um, I don't think there's any rhyme or reason for that other than someone probably just needs a bunch of them. Maybe a particular, practice, a particular organization took on a lot of new uh, services or something. Victoria, I've only done self-study for medical coding with a HEMA and none of the online tools like CPT Assist, AHA Coding Clinic, and other helpful tools like that. So the unfortunate thing about CPT Assist and Coding Clinic is they are paid services. So you do have to pay an additional fee for that. Reason being is there's such additional volumes of them. It would be basically like encyclopedias. So they don't want to put that into the CPT book. They don't want to put them into the ICD 10 CM book. Um, I'm trying to think you can see the licensing fees get tough so you can add them on if you have a program like uh 3m encoder if you have find a code if you have codify if you have select coder any of those you can add them on they typically try not to ask you too many questions about coding clinic or cpt assist on the actual exams because they want you to be able to study, they want you to be able to answer questions that are based off of the resources you have available. So there isn't going to be typically a ton of questions on the exam that are going to test you on something that you have to like pay extra and have read through encyclopedias worth of CPT assist in order to, to know that. When you're working as a medical coder, oftentimes your employer will give you access to resources that you will be able to look up CPT Assist and Coding Clinic and so forth uh, when you need them. Now, having said that, um, I, I'm, I have, I, I don't want to get myself in trouble here. Hold on. Uh, as I understand it, there are some organizations that will buy one login or two logins of certain programs and share the username and password amongst uh, a, a variety of people. I, I, I understand that that does happen in the industry. I'll just say that. <clears throat> John, your office are, yes, the, I've, I've heard that too. People are like, why are we leasing all of these spaces and paying for them when we're not going to bring these people back? Do you think it's difficult to find inpatient coders? I, I think sometimes, yeah, it can be difficult to find um, inpatient coders. Uh, I, I think Part of it is that the CPC has been so prominent in the industry, and it's an easy one to just say, I don't know all this stuff about inpatient, outpatient risk adjustment. I'm just going to go get my CPC. So there's probably less people that get the inpatient certification or less people that want to get through a HEMA because I feel like HEMA, even just my hair is a mess today. Even just looking at their website, like it seems a little bit more, I don't know. There's there's something about it that isn't as warm and friendly, I think maybe as AEPC is. Um, yeah. Victoria, what do you think of AEPC newsletters? Super familiar no. with them. I feel like I get some as an instructor, but I don't read through them. If I was working in a specialty, like if I was working general surgery um, and they have a general surgery newsletter, like sign up for it. But unless you're working in a specific specialty, I don't think you need to like sign up for all of the newsletters, but th they're great content. Um, and I know they, they reach out to a lot of people to uh, provide their expertise for those newsletters and then they are quality. Does the NHA exam count just as much as the AAPC exam? So here's what I'd like to do, because I don't want to get in trouble. So sometimes I show things instead of saying things, okay? 
here's what we're going to do. I'm going to go to indeed.com. And I'm on indeed.com and I'm looking for a remote position for a CPC, right? Um, we have 1,411 jobs that come up for CPC because there's people that are employ the employers are looking for CPC credentials, right? They want that. That's something that we can see is in demand because we went on Indeed, we searched for it. Here's all of the results. What about the CBCS? That's all I'm saying. Um, Kathy, I don't think there's really any cheap ways to get coding clinic and CPT assist. They're all going to charge you about the same and you, you can add them onto things or you can get them. I think they might offer them individually. But there's really no like because of the licensing fees involved, there, there's no discounted ways to get them. Um, everything is is fairly equal as far as the cost, unfortunately. Let's see what else I've got. Let's see where my let's see how many uh, likes I've got on my sock puppet video. Do we want to make, we're at 488. I don't know if the sock puppet video is happening, guys. If you don't go on LinkedIn and like that post and it doesn't get a thousand posts, I can't make my evaluation and management sock puppet video. Because I am right now at, let's see if I can get the post to come up. We are at. Da -da -da, 488. That's it. That's all we got right now. That's, we're not hitting our goal. <laughs> Sock puppets. What is your advice on how to quickly look up codes in my ICD-10CM book? Practice makes perfect. Um, <laughs> with the only thing you could do is move faster or get more familiar with your book. Um, two ways to get familiar with your book. <laughs> Open up your book, start paging through it, get familiar with what's in there, get familiar with where your guidelines are, start looking through your alphabetic index so that you can get familiar with what's in there, get familiar with your external causes, uh, your neoplasm tables, your table of drugs and chemicals, start um, understanding things like when it says C condition, that doesn't mean go under the letter C and look up condition, it means what's the condition of the thing you're looking at. So for example, uh, if you're looking up uh, toe pain, right? Uh, and you start with the word toe, it's going to say C condition. Well, that doesn't mean look up the word condition. It means what's the condition of the toe? Well, it's in pain. Uh, if you're looking up wrist fracture and you start with wrist, it'll say C condition. What's the condition of the wrist? It's fractured. So go to the word fracture instead. Uh, John says tear out pages you never use. Don't say that, John. That's tear, tear out pages you never use. <laughs> I, you should be using all of um, the other thing you can do is, again, the APC is piloting using ebooks for the exams. So I am encouraging people more to start getting familiar with the ebooks. I think there is going to be a day, probably within the next few years, where we might start seeing, I hate to say it, but the end of paper books. Um, and we we kind of knew that was coming when ICD-11 will hit, which I, I don't foresee that happening anywhere near in the future, at least not for the next several years. Um, because ICD-11 is, is so vol voluminous that it can't be printed out. It would be way, way, way. It would be, it's like four times, I think, the amount of this. So you won't have paper books for that. Um, let me go to my library over here. So the other thing you can do is start getting familiar with, uh, the ebook as well. Ebook, ebook. And again, you can just start kind of scrolling through. I'm hoping that the next edition, and maybe it won't happen next edition, but I like how uh, in the CPT ebook, you can click on something and it takes you to it. Like I want to be able to click P15.3 and it takes me to P15.3 and we're not there yet. I think that's maybe one of the things they're working at versus 
excuse me, like if I show you on my CPT book, I think it takes you directly to that section. We're going slow because Victoria's live streaming at the same time. Let's go back. Uh, it doesn't want to go back. Vital, vital source is being a little rough with me right now. Hopefully I'm not freezing too. Uh, wait, page unresponsive. Oh gosh. Okay. Well, never mind. But yeah, you can go through the, the CPT book and I think things are more hyperlinked to take you to the right page versus the ICD-10-CM book. I think we're still getting there. Best help for CPMA study prep. That's a funny one anymore. I used to say make sure you check the materials. They're listed on the AAPC website, but I think they don't have them listed there anymore. They used to have like, here's the OIG website. Here's where you can find out about the different Medicare contractors, fraud and abuse links, and they don't have that anymore. Um, at least not that I saw. So it's harder to harder to do that. They do have a study guide available. I have a course for CPMA if you're interested in taking my on-demand course. Um, other than that, they do have the study guide available online. Let me check and see if they have the list here for certification. CPMA. We should enroll, download the syllabus. Exam, gauge your readiness. See, there used to be like a additional materials, areas of weakness, study guide, taking the exam, what to expect, what to cover. Yeah, I don't, I think they took it off where they used to have all of the links, the different resources that you should use. Book notes, book tabs, breakdown. Um, but yeah, these you might just have to kind of check and find the links yourself of things like where you can find information on Stark Law, the Federal False Claims Act. A lot of the rest of it is on just high level coding auditing. Yes, Kimberly has one as well. Thank you for bringing that up, Sarah. She does a lot of CPMA uh, review courses. I think they're, what, $99 usually? I love medical coding, been doing it for 10 years. Awesome. That's awesome. Sarah, I think just hit her 10 years. Or was it nine years, Sarah, that you just hit? I'm at, I don't even know how much. I <laughs> lost track. What is the benefit of having a C-dip cert? That's one that I have not been too involved in. I'm, I'm going crazy anymore because I feel like there's so many different organizations that are coming out and all these different certifications. And it's like overwhelming. Like a lot of people I know are now getting involved in the um, National Healthcare Compliance Associates or something like that. And I'm like, wow, I just can't believe like there's just so much going on. And I'm like, I don't know. Like, I feel like I would I would forget CEUs for these organizations and forget to renew if I had more than like two organizations I was involved in. Yeah, you know what? That's a cool thing. I'm gonna I'm gonna do a plug right now. Um, if you are someone who's like really interested in evolving in your career, there's some really cool steps you can take to do that. Um, once you get your feet wet and you feel like, oh, I have a good comfort level on like a certain subject, or hey, I have some tips for new coders, you can uh, write that up in an article, send it over to Healthcare Business Monthly. They're amazing editors who will like polish the heck out of it. So it looks like a giant gold star, basically. Uh, even if that's not what you gave them, you gave them a tin can, they will polish it until it's a gold star. And you can get published in Healthcare Business Monthly. That's how I kind of uh, made stepping stones in my career. I got involved in my local chapter. I started uh, volunteering in different roles. 
writing for Healthcare Business Monthly. And then this email came in that was like, hey, since you wrote about this topic in Healthcare Business Monthly, would you like to come and speak in Vegas about the same topic? And I'm like, okay, and put in and was accepted to speak at their Vegas conference. Then went and spoke at the Orlando conference. I spoke at a couple of regionals. I started speaking at other local chapters a lot and then dialed it back. I'm at the point now, though, where I'm ready to start public speaking again, but I think I want to limit the amount of chapters and almost like gamify it. Like if you can defeat me in bubble bobble, I will come and speak at your chapter. So more to come on that, I guess. Again, lots of ideas swirling around in my brain. Um, too much. Can't execute everything. Um, so yeah, that there's a lot of really cool stuff like that that you can do in medical billing and coding. If you're someone who's willing to work like at the elbows of providers, do clinical documentation improvement, buddy up with them, help them out with what they're doing, like that's huge, 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 huge. Yeah, elections are right around the corner and the local AAPC chapters need people to help out. If you've been hesitant to apply to your local chapter because you're like, I don't want to have to pro uh, proctor exams, like starting 2024, you won't have to do that anymore. <laughs> um, so basically, a lot of the things that the local chapters do are find speakers, set up the meetings. So if you're someone who's good at setting up Zoom meetings, uh, I think they still have the requirement to do two in-person meetings a year, you know, barring any um situations where your specific chapter would have to ask to um have an exception made um so that's a lot of what it is it's just helping out the local coders in your area help them get ceus get education you can do things like host workshops or seminars or review classes you don't have to but if your your chapter is particularly involved and feeling ambitious and you want to host reviews and things you can do that as well I think we're going to see a lot more training coming out of local chapters in in the future. But yeah, uh, definitely think about about uh, volunteering, especially in some of those smaller roles. Like if you want to just be secretary of the chapter, or um, what what is it the one that my my friend always used to say is the welcome committee uh, member development. <laughs> they always are in need of people. For the first time medical coder, do you recommend getting an ebook or textbook first? If you can get both, because we're in kind of this transitional period and the AAPC, let me see if they're still offering it. Because that was just such a cool offering that they were saying if you pre-ordered your 2024 books, they'd include the ebooks. Let's see if they're still doing that. I don't know if they still are or not. Shop. 2024 coding books pre-order. Let's see what we got here. Bundles. 2024 edition. Free CEUs. Code books. <laughs> Excuse me. I don't know if they're doing it right now. Uh, facility coder. That was so good. Oh, here we go. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, here it is. Um, so if you're ordering your books, Profi Coder Bundle 2024 with the AMA CPT book, which is what you need, and the ebooks, you can get them for 229 So get both of them if you can. Um, they might they might start allowing them in 2024. I don't know when they're gonna be doing the testing and and uh fi finalize their analysis of using the ebooks for the online exams because i don't know if you guys know this the aapc does not make like rash decisions about anything regarding exams they want to have all of the data and all of their ducks in a row to make significant changes like if they're going to allow ebooks so um we might start seeing in 2024 that they're going to allow for ebooks because they are starting to check and see if that is a viable option I would suspect it would be my my uh, suspicion that we're going to start seeing maybe some transitional periods in 2024 where we're going to say, yeah, you can bring your paper books or your ebooks. They have to work out a lot of factors with that, like with the online uh, proctors. They have to know what they need to look for when they're having someone sign in or, or be provided a ebook. So, yeah. Yeah, I think I think it will take 
a while for the employers to pick up on the micro credentials. It, I think you'll see it more accepted if you're sitting with uh, an interview with someone who works in medical coding versus like the recruiters themselves, I don't think are going to pick up on it as fast as people who are actually working in the industry and know what he is up to. Can you tell us about the CDI micro-credential by HEMA? That one I don't know a lot about. I know they have one that's clinical documentation improvement inpatient and outpatient. I think I saw, no, it wasn't Terry Fletcher. Terry Fletcher got, I think, the outpatient auditing one. So there's not a ton of information about the HEMA micro-credentials out there. And it's a, if you watch my video that I did about the CRC one, it tells you about some of the process involved. <laughs> Excuse me. This is why I don't do long workshops anymore because my voice starts crapping out after an hour. Um, so the, the ones that they have right now for HEMA are risk adjustment, release of information, CDI outpatient, CDI inpatient. Oh, wait, they don't have a CDI. I thought they had a CDI inpatient. Oh, that's funny. They have CDI outpatient microcredential. Then they have patient identification and matching and auditing inpatient, auditing outpatient. Sorry about that. So um, as far as the CDI outpatient one, I really don't know it too much. And I don't think they provide a lot of information. This has been, the, the website's been like very volatile. They've been changing a lot lately about the assessment. Uh, 65 questions, 50 of them are scored, 15 are unscored. Candidates have two hours to complete the assessment, and it says you should be proficient in policy, benefits and drivers, practice, data integrity and quality assurance, technology compliance. So really, other than, oh, they have to download the exam content. So yeah, other than other than what's provided on the website and my experience of the actual taking of the exam, I'm not sure. Because here, like when I look at this, even I'm not seeing anything about like what to bring to the assessment. Can I have this book? Can I Google things? Can I uh, like, like it, there's no information about what what to take to the assessment, right? Like it's still odd. <laughs> um, the COC course. I think I have to, you know, I've got some kinks I need to work out, but um, I'm hoping to get a review class together for COC because I have that like halfway done, but it's just, I get too easily distracted, I think. Um, how realistic is it to get an entry level remote job? It seems like they all want several years of experience. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of that going on in a lot of industries in, in America, basically everything except for what, maybe nursing and teaching. <laughs> I think those are the two top ones, or maybe even uh, some of the software stuff. So it's, it is it is tough. I think you definitely have to have a correct strategy. And it's hard too, because so many people will say, oh, I can't find a job. And that could be any variety of reasons. I mean, they could have a terrible resume. I mean, I'm sure Sarah, if she's still on, could speak to it. I've seen some things on people's resumes where I'm like, what is this? Like, it's three pages long. I had one, someone sent me a resume once because they, I guess they thought I was a coding company and they sent me something um, and they put in that they were proficient in earwax and like just uh, uh, so much stuff going on. Um, some people, if they're looking for in-person positions, they might be in areas where there aren't in-person positions. Some people might not be applying to the right because people maybe don't understand the difference between inpatient or outpatient. Um, so so th there are entry-level positions out there. It's just you have to have the right strategy and you have to really, you, you can't just like blindly apply to everything and send the same blanket resume that hasn't been looked at by someone who works in coding or looked at by someone who knows what recruiters are looking for. Yeah. I think I yeah, I think I think what they meant was maybe coding earwax removal or I think this person maybe had some clinical experience so maybe they also could do in office earwax removal but yeah, it was just listed under their skills earwax. I don't know.
What are your recommendations for learning e &M? I do have a good one that I want to share with you guys. So if you need like free resources on learning e &M, I have stuff available on uh, YouTube. You know, my teaching style is not everyone's teaching style. So I totally recommend getting some other things. Uh, NamUs has some workshops, but if you're like, I need something on the cheap. Um, my medical contractor, Novitas, has such good information that they provide. So let's see here. So they have a whole section here about e &M. They also have so much free education. Where is it? Novitas here. Give me questions. Oh my gosh. Learning Center. Okay, so if you go to their Learning Center, you can get CEUs from Novitas. You don't have to be in Novitas's region. You can still get the CEUs. And they have a great... Uh, list of events. They have on-demand stuff and that's all free to register for. And it's a lot easier to register for them than it used to be. So let's see if I got it here. Calendar, calendar, calendar. Where's the calendar? Event calendar. So here we've got stuff coming up. Cell service tools, partial hospitalization. Here we go. Wednesday, August 30th. Evaluation and management services, office and outpatient, emergency room, home residence. Um, they used to have it that you had to have like a provider and PI number to set up an account. They don't do that anymore. So you can sign up a lot easier. Oh, someone was talking about PEDS, Medicare covered immunization and vaccinations, probably good. EM, hospital observation, critical care. So these are all really, really easy and free to sign up for. Uh, EM, office outpatient. Yeah. And you can just boop, register, put in your information. They'll send you an email. And then you can get CEUs for them too, which is bangering. <clears throat> anyway, guys, it is three o'clock, which means whew, it is time for me to go because I have I have other work I need to do. What was the other thing I wanted to mention to you guys? Let me make sure I got my list together so I don't forget. I feel like there was something else coming up. <laughs> I don't want to forget. I don't want to forget. Um, working on webinars. I am going to be at the NamUs conference in December. If any of you are going to the National Alliance of Medical Auditing Specialist Conference, I will be there in December. Other than that, don't have a lot other in-person stuff booked. I did put in to speak at HealthCon in Vegas. I want to talk about personal branding. That's what I want to I put in to speak about. So we'll see if that's of interest to them. Anyway, thank you guys for hanging out with me at the live stream for the past hour. I will see you guys in the next video. And until then, just keep on coding on.